राम की कमाई इस मा में लूटी गई से राम की कमाई तलवार मोहम्मद के कले जे पे चली है अजाया हे और सी नजनी है ये मा तमे फैसल दे रसूल अरबी है पर हबीब खुदा खातमल अम्बिया बाबाज बुलंद सलवार Brothers, before we begin, uh, they're saying that there's not enough space there in the back. So, if we could all rise up in the name of the twelfth Imam and move forward as much as we can. Rahim Allah, man dakar al qa'ima min ali Muhammad. There is also space in the banquet hall as well. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك وعلى أهل بيتك المظلومين الغرر الميامين المعصومين المنتجبين صلى الله عليك يا مولاي وابن مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة غريب يا مظلوم كربلا يا ليتنا كنا معكم سيدي فنفوز والله فوزا عظيما صلوا على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على The Holy Prophet speaks about his household as the ultimate trial with which people are tested so that the good are vetted from the bad so that the believers and the faithful are vetted from the hypocrites and the non-believers so that those who claim fellowship with the prophet those 
who claim that they love him can have a way to demonstrate that love, can have a way to seek nearness to the Prophet, the mistress of the women of the world, Fatima al Zahra, salawatullahi wa salamu alayha. makes a direct reference to this. Which, by the way, is an instinctual human nature. Everyone understands this. But we need to be reminded every once in a while. So in her sermon, she says, أَيُّهَا nas, O people, مَا هَذِهِ السِّنَةُ عَنْ ظُلَامَتِي what, what is this doze? What is this sleeping? What is this ignorance that I see? of the acts of oppression that are being perpetrated against me. Why are you sleeping it off as though nothing has happened? Why is it that when you have a small elite trying to take over the reins of government, people who are trying to usurp the right of succession by oppressing me and taking away my inheritance, you have that small group wreaking havoc across the nation but you also have the silent majority who are as though they are sleeping. And then she says, Alam yaqur Rasulullah, have you never heard the Prophet say, Al Maru Yuhfadu fi wuldih, that a man is honored through his children? So it's an instinctual thing that we all understand as human beings. If you want to honor someone, you honor their family, you honor their household. However, the Prophet reiterates this fact and he exalts his family to a position where it's no longer just about honoring the Prophet. No. It's not just about that. Don't get me wrong. It's not just about showing respect to the Prophet. It's not just about give him, giving him what he deserves. It's about whether or not you and I pass the test of belief or hypocrisy. That is why they become Babu Hitta, they become the door of Hitta as there was a door of Hitta in the Israelites and Bani Israel. And so last night we spoke about humility when it comes to accepting the truth. Not to have arrogance, to have sincerity, to have humility, to be humble. If you see the truth, you accept it. And as hard as that may be, because as human beings we're all arrogant deep down. As human beings, we all have the tendencies of the Pharaoh deep down. But this is where the test lies. And we also explained how, subhanAllah, you have various people who choose to willingly and deliberately and openly reject the truth and they make fools out of themselves because of that. Atheists are among that group. And mind you, I'm not talking about the agnostics who aren't too sure. I'm not talking about those people who are just simply confused. I'm talking about the atheists who call themselves not just non-believers, but disbelievers. That's what uh, Richard Dawkins says. He says, I'm not just a non-believer. I'm a disbeliever if there's, if there's such a thing. In other words, I don't reject the Christian God or the Muslim God, he says in his book, or the Buddhist God, or the Roman God. I reject the very concept of God. My problem is with God and with no one else. Now, people like that, they see the truth. They choose to reject it because they've got books to sell. And they have lectures to which they want people to, to buy tickets and attend and so on and so forth. Or they simply choose to be provocative and controversial to attract attention. It could be some sort of a problem. They've had psychological issues as children. Whatever the case may be, they choose to reject the manifest and open and clear truth even though it's become clear to them. And even followers of other schools of thought, and I'll say this with all due respect, I say this not to create discord, but to invite people on a common table where we could sit down, discuss things openly to create what I referred to a few years ago when I believe I was here and we had a seminar and I was given the topic of unity and I said, you know, we have two types of unity. We have one type of unity that's based on mutual interests. This is tactical 
style unity. Where two countries, for instance, would find common ground, common interests. They happen to be neighbors, so geographically it's in the best interest of both countries to engage in commercial transactions and work together because their peace and their war, their prosperity and their poverty, all depends on these two countries working with one another. And so they engage in a type of unity that is based on those mutual interests. It's based on these tactical, uh, short-lived, sometimes time-critical issues that are important for them to maintain. However, we have another kind of unity. And to achieve the first kind, by the way, is very easy. All we have to do is say, you know what, let's forget about the differences, let's forget about the disagreements, let's just sit down and find out what the common grounds are, and ignore everything else, as though it doesn't exist. Sweep everything under the carpet, and get that out of the way. Forget history, forget the future, let's just work in the now. It's really easy. The problem with this kind of unity is that it's very fragile. It's very volatile. It's very easy for the balance to shift from one side to another and before you know it, the unity is out the window and there is a war. So a better way of doing this would be to engage in what I like to refer to as strategic unity. And strategic unity is what we call for. Strategic unity is for us to sit down and engage in the difficult conversations, address the hard problems, put all, all the cards on the table, and begin to engage in a meaningful, constructive dialogue that starts from the basics, from the most important pillars and foundations and work our way upwards until we're able to come to an agreement. This is the kind of unity that we desire and this is the kind of unity that we're trying to achieve through these discussions. So, unfortunately, you have people from other schools of thought who, like I mentioned, I quoted Christopher Hitchens last night saying that there isn't enough evidence. When you talk to them about the Ahlul Bayt, they also turn around and say, well, there isn't enough evidence. Well, you say, how much evidence would it take for you to believe that the commander of the faithful was the most qualified person to be appointed to the throne of the succession of the Prophet? Who's better than Ali ibn Abi Talib? And it's not because he's related to the Prophet, by the way. A very common misunderstanding that you'll find even within some Western academic circles where they, they'll tell you that the difference between the Shia and the Sunnis, for instance, is that the Shia believe that the line of succession has to lie within the Prophet's lineage. That's not what we call for. That is the historical reality, yes. But we're not saying that the Ahlul Bayt are God's representatives on earth because they happen to be related to the Prophet. That's not it. It's because they were the most qualified. They were the best of the best, the cream of the crop. Ask anybody, ask their adversaries, ask Muawiyah about Ali ibn Abi Talib. And he'll give you a very good idea of who he was. One day Muawiyah is sitting in his tent, and this is during the Battle of Safin. Battle of Safin, as you know, stretched for a long time. Many thousands of lives were lost because this man wanted to maintain his grip on power in Sham and expand his territory. So he's sitting in his tent. One of the companions of the Imam of Amir al-Mu'mineen, he decides to change sides. He realizes that being on the side of Ali ibn Abi Talib isn't exactly going to pay the bills. Being over there isn't going to bring him riches or give him positions and power. Amir al mumineen never promised anyone that if you do such and such, I'll give you the reins of Sham or I'll give you the reins of Ray or I'll give you the reins of Egypt. He never promised anyone any riches of any kind. And so he decided to switch over to the dark side. He went over to Muawiyah's tent. As soon as he entered, Muawiyah said, Where have you come from? You're a stranger. I've never seen you before. So in order to lick Muawiyah's boots, as they say, he began speaking ill of the commander of the faithful. He said, جئت من عند أعي الناس وأجبن الناس وأبخل الناس I have come to you from the 
most miserly and the most stingy of all men. I have come to you from the most coward of all men. I have come to you from the most verbally incapacitated of all men. The one who doesn't know how to talk, the one who's a coward, and the one who's stingy. جِئْتُ مِنْ عِنْدِ عَلِيِّ بْنَ أَبِي طَالِبِ Muawiyah looked at him sideways. I'm only imagining what Muawiyah was thinking of. Muawiyah was probably thinking, you know what? I'm the one who goes around using my black propaganda apparatus, deceiving people about the true nature of Ali ibn Abi Talib. If anybody has the right to tarnish the image, the pristine, beautiful, magnificent, glorious image of Ali, it's me. You're not going to fool me. He looked at him. He said, who told you so? Wallah, if Ali ibn Abi Talib had two mountains, one of bread and the other of gold, he would give away the one made of gold before he would give away the one made of bread. Wallah, if Ali ibn Abi Talib confronted all the Arabs and all their tribes and all their nations, he would never turn away from them. You're telling me he's a coward. You're telling me he's stingy. And Wallah, it was from Ali ibn Abi Talib that the Arabs learned the Arabic language and you're telling me he cannot speak? <laughs> and so their enemies knew them very well. Unfortunately, however, you keep telling our brothers and our sisters, look at all the evidence, examine history, look at what your leaders and what your rulers have said about the Ahlul Bayt, there was never anyone more qualified, anyone never better than the Ahlul Bayt. And yet they turn around and say, there isn't enough evidence. You say the Prophet stated in front of a crowd of 150,000 people, مَنْ كُنْتُ مَوْلَىٰ فَهَذَا عَلِيٌّ مَوْلَىٰ They say, well, Mawla has different meanings, it's got different interpretations. How clear does, it, does the Prophet have to be? How obvious does it need to be? How many times did the Prophet proclaim to the entire nation that this is my successor and no one else? How much evidence do you need? Really? Really? Do you have an excuse on the Day of Judgment? And so to be humble in the face of the truth. I mentioned a few nights ago that there is a common fallacy. If you allow me, let's indulge a little bit and try and discuss this common fallacy and try and respond to it. Because it is interesting and it is quite common. And that is, why is the name of Ali ibn Abi Talib and the Ahlul Bayt not mentioned in the Qur'an? On the face of it, the argument looks pretty valid. Why? Because first of all, they would claim that we say Imam and the position of the Ahlul Bayt and the succession of the Prophet is one of the most important pillars of the faith. Without that... This faith is subject to interpretation. This faith becomes a something that I refer to as packaged chaos. It looks good from the outside, but come to the inside, and you have a plethora of different ideologies, different beliefs, different sects, different kind of people, one calling for peace, the other calling for war. You're so confused. You don't know which one to follow. It looks good from the outside, but in the inside... It's nothing but sheer chaos. And so, you say that the Khilafah, that the whole question of the succession of the Prophet is so important, if it's that important, how come there's nothing about it in the Qur'an? Let me respond to that in a few points. I don't believe we'll have enough time to cover all of them. Perhaps we'll continue tomorrow, inshaAllah, if we are granted further life. The first point is this. Something that's really obvious, let's start with this. Some of the greatest truths, some of the most obvious facts in the world are not mentioned in the Qur'an. For instance, that God exists. There's no such thing in the Qur'an. God never says that I exist. But isn't that an important thing? Of course it's important. How come God never clearly and explicitly and in a very well-defined way say, Allahu mawjudun? How come He never does that? Well, you might say, because it's obvious. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, such an obvious thing doesn't need to be stated in the Qur'an. Well, it's obvious now, but was it obvious back then? What was the Prophet sent for, essentially? 
The Prophet was sent to the non-believers who rejected the existence of God. So the most obvious thing would be for him to have a verse revealed from God directly that says, I exist. But it's not in the Quran. Number one. Number two. And again, this is another obvious fact that we just want to get out of the way. The words of the Prophet have the same authoritative value as any verse in the Quran. Why? Because the Quran says so. Because God says in the Quran, مَا أَتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُوهُ وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَهُ That which the Prophet reveals to you, you shall take. And that which from which he prohibits you, you should abstain. So if the Prophet says that the number of the units of salah is so and so, we take that as the gospel truth. That is as, as authoritative as any verse in the Quran. God says you should follow the Prophet. So again, it makes no difference whether the name of Ali is mentioned in the Quran or that the Prophet mentions it. In fact, in Sahih Bukhari and in Sahih Muslim, the Prophet is quoted as saying the following hadith over and over and over again. In numerous sources, including these most eminent of sources, these two most eminent collections of hadith in the Sunni school of thought, in the school of thought of our brothers and sisters, the Prophet is quoted as saying, الْخُلَفَاءُ مِنْ بَعْدِي إِثْنَا عَشَرْ The successors after me are twelve. What happened? What happened to the hadith? Where is that hadith in your belief matrix? We're called the Twelvers based on your hadith. So again, another obvious fact, let's get it out of the way. Now get to the actual arguments. Now the first argument is a rebuttal. And the difference between a rebuttal and an actual response is that it doesn't solve the problem, but it does show and it does indicate a particular side of the problem. And it shows you that this is not necessarily the case across the board. Let me explain. Are the Khulafa important? Of course they are, right? You say that Abu Bakr was the Prophet's best friend. He was his BFF. Best friend forever. He was the first Khalifa, right? How about Omar? He was very important. The second Khalifa. Abu Bakr is the most beloved man to the Prophet according to them. Well, how about having the name of the most beloved man to the Prophet mentioned explicitly and in a clearly defined way by name in the Qur'an. Where is it? It's not there, is it? Why isn't Umar's name mentioned in the Qur'an? The second Khalifa. Why isn't the name of Uthman mentioned in the Qur'an? Why is it, isn't the name of the most beloved human being, according to them, the most beloved human being to the Prophet, is, is Aisha, his wife. Because they, they narrate this hadith, which is false. But they narrate the hadith. And, and the reason it's false is that it contradicts with dozens of other hadith in which the Prophet says that the most beloved person to me is Ali ibn Abi Talib. The most beloved person to me is my flesh and blood, Fatima. And they come to him, sallallahu alayhi wa So it's clearly contradictory. And it lacks the authentication that the other hadith have. However, but this is what they say, that somebody came up to the Prophet, he said, Ya Rasulullah, man ahabbu nasi ilayk? Who do you love the most out of everyone? Qala Aisha. He said, Aisha. And then they said, who's next after Aisha? Qala Abuha, her father. Right. So the most beloved person of the Prophet is his wife. Not his former wife Khadija to whom he was married in a perfect, beautiful, splendid, monogamous marriage for years and years, and from whom he has his only line of descendants. Not her, but Aisha. Fine. Who's the second one? Abu Bakr. How come their name isn't in the Qur'an? In fact, what's really interesting is that now everyone believes that Ali ibn Abi Talib is a Khalifa, right? We all are in agreement. Allahumma sallam. We're all in agreement that Ali was a Khalifa. Where's the disagreement? The disagreement is in the first three Khulafa. Why didn't God solve the problem 
get this whole argument over and done with forever, and he knows what the problems are going to be in the future. God knows everything. Why not have their names clearly mentioned in the Qur'an so that we wouldn't, ha would, wouldn't be having this conversation tonight? So that our youths wouldn't be going out there at universities and at the workplace being bombarded with these questions and fallacies like why isn't the name of Ali mentioned in the Qur'an? Why not just have their names mentioned? In fact, again, something that's truly remarkable is that you'll notice in many verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about these three khulafa, or one of them at least, and he deliberately avoids mentioning their name. He sidetracks them. Such as the verse in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, tansuruh. Listen to the verse. He says, tansuruh. If you do not support him, who? The Prophet. فَقَدْ نَصَرَهُ اللَّهِ God has verily supported him. Supported who? Him. It's singular. The Prophet only. How? Where? إِذْ أَخْرَجَهُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا ثَانِيَ اثْنَيْنِ When the non-believers drove him out of where? Of the holy city of Mecca. When he was the second of the two. ثَانِيَ اثْنَيْنِ well, why not just mention the name of the other person? We know that we're talking about the Prophet here, right? The other person is the source of confusion here. We're not so sure who that is. Why not just mention him by name? Get it over and done with. We would have been more than happy to accept him. ثَانِيَةْ اثْنَيْنِ إِذْ هُمَا فِي الْغَارِ When they are in the cave, إِذْ يَقُولُ لِصَاحِبِهِ لَا تَحْزَنْ And it's at that point that the Prophet says to his companion, do not grieve. Now, if someone was engaging in an activity, and I came up to that person, or you came up to that person and said, do not do this, what does that make that activity? A good one or a bad one? Clearly a bad one, right? So imagine if the messenger of God is the one who says to you or to anybody else, do not do this. Don't grieve. What that means is, what you're doing is wrong, brother. This is wrong. Stop doing it. Moving on. Inna Allah ma'ana. God is with us. Well, of course God is with us. God is with everybody. God, according to the Holy Quran, if there are two, God is always the third. If there are three people, God is always the fourth. He's always there. He's with everyone. Inna Allah ma'ana. فَأَنزَلَ اللَّهُ سَكِينَتَهُ God then revealed His serenity upon Him. Not them. Just Him. Him alone. وَأَيَّدَهُ And He supported Him. Not them. Just Him. Even though just, just before that, we're talking about two people. The second of the two. Suddenly God says, I sent my support, I sent my serenity and tranquility and calmness, and I sent it to Him. And I supported Him, only the Prophet. بِجُنُودٍ لَمْ تَرَوْهَا وَجَعَلَ كَلِمَةَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا السُفْلَى وَكَلِمَةُ اللَّهِ هِيَ الْعُلْيَى وَاللَّهُ عَزِيزٌ حَكِيمٌ So even though God could have easily mentioned His name, He sidetracked Him. He avoided mentioning the name altogether. So again, back to the original question. Why didn't God mention the name of the Ahlul Bayt in the Qur'an? Our question to you is, why didn't He mention the name of the Khulafa? More still, here's something that's really interesting. You all know the importance of the status of the Sahaba in the Sunni school of thought. The Sahaba occupy a central position. Why? Because religion is based on not only their narration of the prophetic traditions, but also their interpretation of the Qur'an as well as the narrations of the Prophet. So their role isn't just to quote the Prophet, but also explain it, elaborate it, interpret it, and give their own opinions of it. And that's why they're so important. Now, here's a question. How come we're still in disagreement about what constitutes a companion of the Prophet? Bukhari says, listen to these different opinions. Bukhari says, Al-Imam Al-Bukhari, who has a major shrine in a city called Khartang, an absolute massive mausoleum, and yet the mausoleum of the Ahlul Bayt, the Baqiya, would have to be demolished. Samarra would have to be blown up. Karbala would have to explode. 
but not their shrines and their mausoleums. Bukhari says that a the definition of a companion is one who has accompanied the Prophet. What that means is, if the Prophet came out of his house, walked 20 steps to the mosque, and you just happen to be there, you go up to the Prophet and you walk those 20 steps along with him, you automatically become a companion. And you receive that exalted state. So he says a companion is one who walked with the Prophet, who accompanied the Prophet at any stage in his lifetime. Or one who saw the Prophet. If you saw the Prophet coming out of his house, and you ran towards him, you started sprinting, but you didn't actually make it to him, but you did see him, that makes you a Prophet. Good for you, you get a certificate. That's the opinion of Bukhari. The opinion of Ahmad ibn Hanbal is as such. He says, no, 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 hang on a second. We need to be a lot more discerning, a lot more careful. We need to filter out the good from the bad. You can't just have anybody be with the Prophet and automatically attain the title of a companion. Why? Because the title of a companion automatically makes you a adil. In other words, you, you'd become automatically just. Your testimony is accepted without question. Your position in society becomes extremely pivotal and central. So Ahmad bin Hanbal says no. To, in order to be a companion, you would have to accompany the Prophet for a month. At least, right? Then he says, no, no. Um, a week is fine. Then he says, in the same sentence, literally. Then he says, no. A week is too much. A day. Then he says, no, no. An hour. Then he says, you know what? Anyone who ever casts his eye upon the Prophet is a companion. You see him, you're a companion. Fine. Another person comes and he says, this is a third opinion within the, that particular school of thought. They say, no, no. A companion is one who at least narrates one single quote from the Prophet. So you narrate a hadith, you become a companion. A fourth opinion is that a companion is one who accompanies the Prophet for at least a year and goes to war with him in one of the battles. So having all these different opinions, what, what is so hard about simply having one single verse in the Qur'an which says a companion is so and so and so? How hard would that have been? Why doesn't God get this dispute resolved once and for all by having a, a, a verse, not a whole chapter, but a single verse that explains what a companion is? And then we wouldn't be having this conversation. We'd be living much more comfortable lives. So next time somebody comes up to you and says, where is the name of Ali ibn Abi Talib? You have a whole list of questions to ask them. Where is the list of all the companions? Why not have the names of every companion mentioned in the Qur'an? That would be beautiful, wouldn't it? And instead of 600 pages, the Qur'an would be what? Let's say 700, a thousand. But isn't that worth it though? Because on the other side, you'd have peace and tranquility and there'd be no bloodshed and everyone would agree on who a companion is and the khulafa and their order and their names. So that's the first response. The second response, which as I said is a rebuttal. The second response is this. They claim that if the names of the Ahlul Bayt were mentioned in the Qur'an, we would, not ha we would not have any problems. That the dispute would be resolved, that the disagreements would come to an end, and that we'd all live happily ever after. Well, I contest that claim. I disagree. I don't think that's true. Do you all think that if the names of the Ahlul Bayt were mentioned, we wouldn't have any problem? I don't think so. Why? Because the Prophet's name is mentioned in the Qur'an and yet they were hypocrites back in the Prophet's time. If naming someone in the Qur'an would have solved the problem, then the Prophet's name is mentioned. He was clearly a Prophet. He split the moon for crying out loud. He performed miracles for them. Just, just as Jesus did. Imagine raising someone from the dead. We're not talking about some you know, sci-fi Hollywood wizardry. We're not talking about some optical illusions. We're talking about going up to a grave of someone who'd been buried for 50 years and then unearthing that individual, resurrecting him from the dead. And yet people rejected the Prophet. They chose not, they took him, they tried to crucify him. They tortured him. By the way, as Muslims, we believe that Jesus was in fact tortured. 
He was beaten. He was tortured. He went through a great deal of pain and suffering. The only thing we reject is, is, is the crucifixion. So they chose to reject him even though he was performing miracles left, right and center. That didn't seem to bring any sense to the non-believers. A non-believer will always be a non-believer. I'm not saying people don't have the potential to convert. But someone who has what the Ahlul Bayt call Tina Khabitha, an evil nature, you can't change them. Their evil nature are, is always going to stay right there. There's no way Abu Lahab would have converted to Islam. No way. And by the way, this is one of the miracles of the Qur'an. Imagine God talks about Abu Lahab in the Qur'an. He condemns him. He curses him. All Abu Lahab needed to do was to pretend to embrace this religion and falsify the claim of the Qur'an. Imagine what an imbecile he was. Imagine he didn't even have the, for, the foresight of some of his other comrades, the other hypocrites and the other non-believers, who at least after a while when they saw the sword of Ali ibn Abi Talib approaching, they said, you know what, we're all Muslims now, we'll believe. He didn't even have that. And so he failed to do it. He could have falsified the whole religion of Islam. And so he couldn't have converted. He just couldn't. He's got an evil nature and that couldn't change. So, again, the Prophet's name and mention is mentioned and that didn't seem to help the hypocrites. There were so many of them that there's a whole chapter dedicated to them in the Qur'an. Al-Munafiqun. And God talks about them. وَمِنْ أَهْلِ الْمَدِينَةِ مَرَدُوا عَلَى النِّفَاقِ There are people in the city of Medina, in the city of the Prophet, who see the Prophet day in and day out who are hypocrites. So having it mentioned in the Qur'an was not going to solve the problem. Let me give you another example. How many prayers do we have a day? What are the times of prayers? Now this has been one of those long-standing disputes between the Shia and the Sunni, right? Where the Sunni say it's five times, the Shia say it's three times. Well, I remember the other day someone called into the uh, a live show on the channel and he said, he said, I've gone through many Shia calendars. I'm a Sunni. I've gone through many Shia calendars. And, and not once have I come across a calendar which has listed the five prayer times. It's always three. Why? What's wrong with you people? It's five, it's five times. Why not just list the five prayer times so people could follow it? And I know there's a, you know, you have, uh, there's flexibility there. You get the option of either praying it five times or joining some of the prayers. But why not have five times? My response to that is very simple. Instead of looking up Shia calendars, look up the Quran. What does God say in the Qur'an? How many prayer times does God talk about in the Qur'an? Three, not five. أَقِمِ الصَّلَاةَ لِدُلُوكِ الشَّمْسِ إِلَىٰ غَسَقِ اللَّيْلِ وَقُرْآنَ الْفَجْرِ إِنَّ قُرْآنَ الْفَجْرِ كَانَ مَشْهُودًا Allah says, pray during the, these three times. One, before the sun sets. In other words, you have enough time. لِدُلُوكِ الشَّمْسِ means until the sun sets, until the sun disappears. Which is a reference to what? To Salat Dhuhr and Asr. That's how much time you have. إِلَىٰ غَسَقِ اللَّيْلِ Which means to the darkness of night. Until the darkness of night, you also have another, which is Salat Al-Isha. And then you have Qur'an Al-Fajr, which is the recitation of the dawn, which is a reference to Salat Al-Subuh. Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha. And Salat al-Subh. So God talks about three times of prayer in the Qur'an. Has that solved the dispute? No. Do you know why it hasn't? Arrogance. Sometimes ignorance. But for the most part, arrogance. The Qur'an is clear. So our response to those who say, why isn't Ali ibn Abi Talib's name mentioned in the Qur'an? Had it been mentioned, we wouldn't have been having this discussion. No, we would. We still would. Because just like the Prophet said, مَنْ كُنْتُ مَوْلَىٰ فَهَذَا عَلِيٌ مَوْلَىٰ And yet you went and tried to misinterpret this narration, you would have misinterpreted the name of Ali ibn Abi Talib. You would have changed it. Another example, God says in the Qur'an, لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ There is nothing as the likeness of God. And He doesn't say there's nothing like God. There is nothing as the likeness of God. There's nothing like the likeness of God. You can't even think, you can't even fathom God. You can't ever depict a picture of God. This is a fallacy by itself. We have this very clear verse. 
Another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Musa, لَن تَرَانِي Oh Musa, you will never see me. How clear does it have to get? And yet, they say that there is a hadith that God rides on the back of a donkey. Every Thursday night, he comes down. I'm just wondering how come God doesn't have a private jet or, I mean, seriously, why a donkey? You know, keep up with the times, you know? He rides on the back of a donkey, comes down, starts to scream in the middle of the sky. On the day of judgment, we're going to see God. What's even worse than that, and I apologize, but this is, these are the facts. They narrate a hadith that the Prophet, when he ascended to the seventh heaven, he was on the mi'raj, he then came back and told the companions, Oh, I saw it all. I saw God, and you can ask me about his appearance. I'll tell you every tiny, itsy, bitsy little detail, except for the genitals, except for the private parts. Please don't ask me about that. I'm ashamed of talking about it. I, I wouldn't be comfortable. In other words, I saw it, but I'm not comfortable talking about it. God says in the Quran, لَن تَرَانِي لَيْسَ شَيْءٍ How can God explain this concept? He's explained it like you do to a four-year-old. And yet you have all these hadith on which they base their beliefs. So again, would the names having been clearly defined and mentioned in the Qur'an have solved the problem? The answer to that is a resounding no. So that's another response. The third response. They say, if Ali ibn Abi Talib is so important, if the Ahlul Bayt are so important, if Imam al Hussein is so important, that you commemorate his martyrdom year in and year out. Not just every year, mind you, but every week, sometimes every day. There are Husayniyat mosques in some countries that I've seen. For instance, in Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, and places like that. There are Imam Bargas where they hold a majlis for Aba Abdullah al Hussein twice a day, 365 days a year. Morning and night. So if, if it's that important, how come it's not in the Quran? And how come it's not even mentioned once? How come it doesn't have a chapter dedicated to this? How come there are no verses talking about this? How come, and I'm sure you've heard this argument, how come this particular issue, not necessarily the Ahlul Bayt, but even amongst us, we sometimes debate these things. And I've heard perhaps some sisters, some very respected, dear sisters, who reject the notion of hijab. And you know, by the way, there's a difference between one who doesn't wear hijab, and that would be an act of impiety, and one who rejects the notion of hijab and says, you know what, hijab is not even wajib. And their argument is what? They cling on to some pathetic arguments, with all due respect. They cling on to some arguments such as, how many times is hijab mentioned in the Qur'an? What, once, twice? Well, that means it's not that important. How many times is khums mentioned in the Qur'an? Once? Well, that's not that important then, because it's only mentioned once. Brothers and sisters, we're talking about God, our Creator, the Lord of the universe. How many times does it take for us to, to accept His commandments? How many? That's exactly what God talks about in the Qur'an. When alcohol was prohibited, God revealed a verse. Alcohol is prohibited. But obviously, old habits die hard, right? When you have a whole factory that you've made for yourself at home, when you have a place to produce alcohol right there in your bedroom, it's not going to be easy to give up this old habit. So they wouldn't give it up. God revealed another verse. Again, they wouldn't give it up. And then, the third verse was revealed, and after that, God says, Ala antum muntahun? Are you not going to stop? How many times do we have to tell you? So they say, one of the so-called great companions got up and he said, Intahayna, intahayna. That's it, that's it. We're not going to do it anymore. At least not in public. Or we'll do it socially. And I can quit any time, right? So, how many times does it have to be mentioned? In fact, let me, let me give you this example. The name of Musa is mentioned dozens of times in the Qur'an. Whereas the name of our Prophet is mentioned only four times. Does that mean that Musa is more important than the Prophet? Of course not. Another very simple example. We have a whole chapter dedicated, 
A whole chapter named after a cow. Yet we don't have a chapter named after Jesus, for instance. We have a whole chapter named after the ant, the ant of Solomon. But we don't have a chapter named after Solomon himself, which is important. The ant or Solomon. So, whether something is mentioned in the Qur'an, clearly, how many times something is mentioned in the Qur'an, none of these two factors are any measure of the value of the subject matter. It doesn't matter whether it's mentioned once or a hundred times. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have elaborated on everything in the Qur'an. He could have explained everything. Qur'an has tibyanan li kulli shay. Tibyan means explanations. God has explained everything in the Qur'an. But has He really? Really? Has God discussed, for instance, the form of uh, the, the form and shape and structure of, of the Islamic government? Has God spoken about the details of prayer, the details of hajj? Has God spoken about the science of hermeneutics? Has God spoken about these things in the Qur'an? No. Tibiyana li kulli shay is an explanation for everything. When you put the Qur'an next to those who interpret the Qur'an, who were recipients of the verses of the Qur'an. Those upon whom the Qur'an was revealed. Those in whose house the Qur'an was sent. The Ahlul Bayt. The other weighty object that the Prophet left for us. Al-Thiqlul, Al-Thani, the household, the kindred, the progeny. That's when the Qur'an becomes an explanation for everything. Otherwise, if the Qur'an was an explanation for every single thing in the world, it wouldn't be 600 pages, it would be a billion volumes. True or not true? So even though the Qur'an explains everything, another example, really basic one, you know how many times God mentions prostration, sujood in the Qur'an? 93 times. But not once does God talk about what we can prostrate on. Why couldn't God just say you can prostrate on carpet, you can prostrate on cupcakes, you can prostrate on each other's backs as they sometimes do in Hajj, you can prostrate on your turban, you can prostrate on this or on that. Why didn't God elaborate? Why didn't he explain these things? It's very simple, brothers and sisters. Because God gives you the main facts. He wants you to think. He wants you to deduce based on the evidence available to you. He wants you to be the rational human being that you are. He wants you to be that logical thinking animal that we all are. He wants you to be a human being. He wants you to go and follow the lead of the Prophet. He wants you to take the book and when you see a verse that says, مَا آتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُوهُ وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَهُ You know that you need to go and knock on the door of Rasulullah. You knock on the door of Ali ibn Abi Talib. You knock on the door of those that the Prophet appointed to be his successors. Inshallah, we'll talk about some of the other arguments. There are roughly another five or six that we'll be talking about in the upcoming nights. However, this brings me to the main point, which is that when you find the truth, accept it, as hard as that may be. Even if it's a simple piece of advice that you get. We've been told, we have narrations that say that if someone offers you a piece of advice, accept it. And if there was a piece of advice, something useful for you to follow and take with you and treasure. Even if you take that from the intestines of a pig, take it. Now, by the way, mind you, we're not talking about matters of belief. We're talking about advice. Advice means, you know, brother, this is not good. That is good. Do this, don't do that. We're not talking about, you know, issues that have to do with our belief system. You don't take that from just anybody. You don't take it from any Tom, Dick, or Harry. You take it from the right source. However, but when it comes to advice, accept it, take it, be humble. Don't see yourself as being above others. Don't see, subhanAllah. I was at a church. Uh, we used to have these um, interfaith sessions, which were really interesting, very eye-opening, not so much for us, but for them, I guess. So, the first day we attended, 
by the way, the, the priest and I are very good friends now. But the first day, I didn't really know him, he didn't know me. So we just showed up at the church, there were three of us, and about 20 of them. We thought this was one of those really friendly uh, interfaith sessions where we'd sit down and compliment each other and pat each other on the back and have some tea and cakes and leave. As it turns out, it was an ambush. So we sat there. This friend of mine, he looked at me and he said, what do you think about Christians? Where will Christians end up on the Day of Judgment? I said to him what I truly believe. I said, well, you know what? I don't hold the, the keys to the gates of hell or heaven. I'm not the one who chooses who goes to heaven or hell. What I can tell you is that this belief of yours is wrong and I can prove you wrong. That's as far as I'm willing to go. I'm not going to say that you're going to hell for sure or you're going... I can't say that about myself. And then I mentioned an example. I said... Our holy Imam, Imam al-Sadiq sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, He says to us, he teaches us these brilliant morals. And he says that you should never look at someone as though he or she is lower in rank than you are until you see their ultimate fate, what happens to them at the time of death, that with that information, you can then evaluate their lives. You can't look at them now, take a glimpse, take a snapshot from their lives, and judge them and evaluate them in accordance with that snapshot. And you also don't know where you're going to end up before your death. You don't know that you're going to be a believer before your death. You don't know that you're going to be a lover of the Ahlul Bayt prior to surrendering your, surrendering your soul to its Lord. You don't know that. So the Imam mentions an example. He says, just like the sorcerers of Fir'aun, Saharat Fir'aun, the sorcerers, the magicians, they, the Imam says, Asbahu kuffara fajarah wa batu mu'minina shuhada. They woke up that morning being non-believers, they were sorcerers who engaged in an illicit um, occupation and profession. But that night they were laid to rest as believers in the Almighty God. But not just believers, but also martyrs in His sake. Never judge anybody. So I mentioned this to, the, to our Christian friend. And then I said, well, what do you think about Muslims? He said, oh, that. Yeah, you and the Catholics, you're all going to hell. There's no question about it. And then we continued to discuss, the, the sessions went on for quite a while, a few months. And we'd go there and we'd sit down and we'd present our arguments. And we had a brother with me who knows the Bible back to front. He's really good at that. He was quoting the Bible nonstop. I was trying to kind of approach things from a more logical perspective. And so one day, the question of the divinity of Jesus came up. And we started talking about that. And obviously this is one of the most important things that we need to discuss. So I said to him, listen, let, let me just give you the skinny on this. Let me give you the very basic facts and let you make up your mind on it. Here's the thing. If God can emerge in human form, that would mean he would be limited in time and space. He would not only be constrained and limited by his own creations, time and space, right? these spatial dimensions, not only is he constrained by these, but if he's here, he's not going to be there. That space is going to be devoid of him. But when you talk about God, you're talking about a supernatural being. I said, you Christians, I love it when you debate with atheists. Because you sit down and you bring forth logical arguments that are absolutely beautiful. Atheists say, well, if you're going to use the argument that if... We exist, therefore, we should have had a creator. Then God should have had a creator. So Christians respond by saying, and we say the same thing, that no, God does not have a creator because God is supernatural. He is not within the realm of the world of physics. He is not constrained by the laws of this universe. He is not within this natural world. He's beyond the natural world. He is supernatural. So he does not need a cause. He does not need someone or something to create him, right? So, very logical, very beautiful. And yet, when you're not debating with atheists and you're talking to me, suddenly God is not so supernatural. God becomes a human being. God becomes a man in the flesh who gets crucified and killed. How, how, do, you, how do you explain that? 
And then he said to me, but no, if you say, listen to this argument, he said, if you claim that God cannot emerge in human being, he cannot appear in human form, you're saying that there's something that God can't do. But God can do anything, right? If God can do anything, he's all powerful, he's omnipotent, as we say, therefore he should be able to do whatever he likes, including appearing in human form. I said, well, let me ask you a question. God can do anything? He said, absolutely. And if you claim otherwise, then you're limiting God. I said, let me ask you a question then. Can God be stupid? He started looking at the ceiling. I said, why are you looking at the ceiling, bro? Are you waiting for God to give you some help? Look at me. This is, this is a basic logical argument. Can God be stupid? Can God be an imbecile? Can God be mentally retarded? Can God be crippled? Can... Not that these things are bad. We're, when we're talking about God, we're talking about perfection in every single sense of the word. If God can't be these things, then why are you limiting God? I said, here's why. You're not limiting God. Because when you attribute deficiencies to God, when you say that God can appear in human form and be limited and constrained by time and space and be emotional and be born and then live and eat and drink and then get killed on the cross, you're attributing deficiencies to him. Now these are things that God cannot, cannot do. Why? Not that he's limited in his power, he's omnipotent. But doing these things would mean that he is not all powerful. So be humble, accept the truth. For when you are humble, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exalts you. When you are humble, God does to you what He has done with the Ahlul Bayt. Look at the Ahlul Bayt and their examples. And inshallah, in the next few nights, we'll mention some of those examples. The humility of the Ahlul Bayt. God exalts you without you intervening in any way. Look at Imam Zayn al Abidin, Hisham ibn Abdul Malik is sitting on his throne. He tries to approach, you've all heard the story, he tries to approach the black rock, Al-Hajar Al-Aswad. And he is the Khalifa of the Muslim nation. And yet, when he goes in, nobody cares if he's the Khalifa. No one is going to give him way. People are trying to grab on to Hajar Al-Aswad, to grab on the black rock, and say, Ilahi amanati addaytuha wa ahdi ta'ahattu. And so he tries to get to the black rock, nobody gives him any, any space to move. He tries, he brings his troops, he brings his bodyguards, and... The, the crowds are so congested, nobody cares who this guy is. They push him out of the way. He goes on Mount Safa, he sits on his throne, just observing, wishing he could go and approach the black rock. Suddenly, an unassuming person walks into the mosque. A, a person who's lowered his head humbly before his Lord. Ilahi al baytu baytuk. والحرم حرمك والعبد عبدك O oh Lord, this is your house this is your sacred ground and this is your slave he walks in as soon as people see this man suddenly they walk away paving the path for him to go towards Hajar al-Aswad فَكَانَ السَّعِيدُ مِنْهُمْ listen to the narrators they say that the lucky ones were the ones who could grab on to his hands so they could kiss them the lucky ones were the ones who could grab on to his ihram so they could seek barakah let me just say something here since we're on the subject let me address the imam of our time يَا حُجَّةَ بْنَ الْحَسَنِ when will it be the day when you walk in our midst so that we would approach you, kiss your hands and touch your clothes. Ya Mu'azza al-Awliya wa Mudhilla al-A'da. So the Imam walks in, suddenly everyone begins to scream, La ilaha illallah, subhanallah. The atmosphere in Masjid al-Haram changes completely. There is a, a, a transformation that, that happens inherently. And the Imam goes and he touches Hajar al-Aswad. Banu Umayya are sitting on Mount Safa looking at this, wondering who this is. So they say to Hisham ibn Abdul Malik, who is this man? He was filled with rage, filled with anger. He looks at them and says, La Adri. Al Farazdaq is sitting there. Farazdaq looks up. He'd had enough. Farazdaq was his own personal poet. He was the one who would be praising the Khalifa non stop. And yet at this stage, Farazdaq decides, that enough is enough. How could you say, I don't know who this is? 
تعرف البطحاء وطأته والبيت يعرفه والحل والحرم and then he says هذا ابن فاطمة اللهم صل على محمد هذا ابن فاطمة إن كنت جاهله بجده أنبياء الله قد ختموا وليس قولك من هذا بضائره العرب تعرف من هذا العرب تعرف هذا العرب تعرفه والعجم the fact that you say I don't know who this is isn't gonna hurt him the Arabs know him, the non-Arabs know, know him, the house of God knows him, the earth knows him, the sky knows him. This is Ali ibn al Hussein. this is the son of Fatima, this is the one who is the descendant of Rasulullah, with whom God ended prophetic messages, and there were no longer going to be any prophets through his grandfather Rasulullah. When you humble yourself before the Lord, God exalts you, and this is exactly what the companions of Aba Abdullah al Hussein enjoyed to the point that Imam al Hussein, listen, on the night of Ashura, the Imam approaches these great men. It's dark, the times are tense, people know what's about to come, and the next day, the Imam comes into their tent. He says to them, Inni la a'lamu ashaban khayran wala. I do not know of any companions better or more loyal than my own. And I do not know greater households and people who are better to their, to their father than my own household. This is the darkness of night. هَذَا اللَّيْلْ قَدْ غَشِيَكُمْ فَاتَّخِذُوهُ جَمَلًا Use the darkness to your advantage. Take the hand of your comrades. Take the hand of one of my family members. And walk away. Go, you don't have to stay. These people want me, and if they get a hold of me, they want nothing with you. The first person to get up and to respond to the Imam was Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, speaking on behalf of the household of, of the Imam. He gets up and he says, Ya Aba Abdullah, you want us to see the day you die while we continue to live after you? La aran Allahu ذلك اليوم May God never show us the day when we do not see you walking on the earth. Ya Aba Abdullah. And then the companions get up. But before that, the Imam addresses the household of, of Aqil, the children of Aqil. He says to them, Hasbukum Muslim. Min al qatl, Muslim got killed. That is enough reason for you to grieve for a lifetime. Take your brothers, take your family members, and walk off. One of them got up and he said, Oh uncle, Ya Aba Abdullah, you are the best uncle anyone could ever wish for. You want us to abandon you and go back and tell people what? That we abandoned Aba Abdullah al Hussein. By God, we will not depart you. And then the companions, one after the other. The first was Muslim ibn Awsaja, an 80 year old man. Imagine a companion of the Prophet. He gets up and he says, Ya Aba Abdullah, I'm old, yes. But as long as I can hold on to the handle of the sword, I will keep stabbing the chests of the enemies and keep you alive. As long as I can hold the spear, I will break it in the skulls of, the, of your enemies. I will never abandon you. And I swear to God, listen, I swear to God that if they took me, they killed me, then they raised me from the dead, burnt my flesh while I was alive, and they continue to do that 70 times, I would never abandon you. Another one gets up and says, Ya Aba Abdullah, if they took me, Zuhair ibn al Qain, he says, if they killed me, then resurrected me, and continue to do that a thousand times, I will not abandon you. Aw amuta dunak, I wish to die. Defending you and protecting your life and the life of your household. One after the other, they get up and they show their courage to Aba Abdullah al Hussein. Then the Imam walks off. He goes out to try and inspect the trenches, inspect the tents, so that the enemy does not take them by surprise. One of the companions of the Imam by the name of Nafi ibn Hilal, he walks out to follow the Imam. The Imam sees him, he says to him, What brought you out? 
in this darkness. He said, Ya Aba Abdullah, I saw you going out. I wanted to offer some protection to be in your service. The Imam said to him, thank you. I was just here trying to inspect the trenches so they don't take us by surprise and ambush us. And then the Imam said to him, do you see this darkness? Why don't you slip through these two mountains and walk away? You don't have to get killed, just go. Suddenly he looked at the Imam and he said, Sayyidi thakalatni ummi. My master, may my mother grieve over me. You want me to abandon you, Ya Aba Abdullah? Another companion, his son had been captured by Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad in Kufa. And news had reached to the camp and they knew that his son had gone. So the Imam comes up to him and he says to him, Old man, your son has been captured. Why don't you... Go, I relieve you of your duties. You have no allegiance to me. It's okay, I don't mind. You can go. In fact, I think you should go and save your son. He looked at the Imam. He said, Ya Aba Abdullah, Wallahi la yakun. By God, I won't let that happen. In other words, Ya Aba Abdullah, stop saying these things. We won't abandon you. We'll never leave you. So they say that Aba Abdullah went to the tent. He began speaking with his sister Zainab. He began talking about his own death. Zainab cried. She fell unconscious. The details we'll talk about on the night of Ashura. Then the Imam brought some water and he spilled it over her face. She woke up. Then she said to him, Ya Aba Abdullah, have you tested your companions? Are they going to be loyal to you? I'm afraid that they would abandon you and leave you when the time comes. They say that Nafa was still outside the tent, overheard the conversation. He ran towards who? None other than Habib ibn Mudahir. He said to him, Ya Habib, I just heard the daughter of Rasulullah worried and anxious that we would abandon Aba Abdullah. Habib got up, they went to the tent of the Ashab. He said to them, Ya Ashab Abi Abdullah, O companions of Aba Abdullah, O people who have vowed to have your blood spill for this cause, let us show our courage to Zainab. They all get up, they go out of their tents like roaring, raging lions. They approach the tent of Zainab, they begin shaking their spears and their swords saying, we are here to have our souls given for the sake of Aba Abdullah. Now it's important for someone to show their courage at this time. What's even more important is for someone to show courage at the time of death. And that is exactly what Muslim Ibn Awsaja did. Aba Abdullah al Hussein lost so many of his companions, crying for each and every single one of them. He cried for everyone. But when Muslim Ibn Awsaja fell to the ground, Aba Abdullah accompanied Habib ibn Mudahir, they went to his side. The Imam looked at him, he praised him. Then Habib ibn Mudahir said to Muslim ibn Awsaja, Oh brother, had it not been for the fact that I would be following your footsteps, I would have wished that you give me some last minute instructions. Is there anything you'd like me to do? Would you like me to take your body back to the tent? Would you like me to have you buried if I could? But I know I will be following in your footsteps. Is there something you'd like me to do? Muslim ibn Awsaj looks up. He points to Aba Abdullah. He said, yes, I do have instructions. Alayka bihad al gharib Take care of the stranger in this land. Waqatil dunahu hatta tuqtal. And fight in his way until you die. How could Habib not do that? Habib ibn Mudahir, the Imam called him Ar-Rajul al faqih the knowledgeable man, the jurist. The Imam summoned him personally to come to Karbala. The Imam didn't do that to everyone. He made general calls. But when it came time for Habib, the, the Imam wanted a special companion. So he summoned him, he sent him a message. When he received the message, the situation was tense. He didn't want people to know 
that he had decided to go to Karbala and join his master Aba Abdullah. So he sends his slave with his horse to the outskirts of the city of Kufa. He says to him, go out there, wait for me, I will come at night and then you are relieved. I will take my horse and I will go on my way. So Habib takes a little longer to arrive at that location. By the time he arrives, he notices this slave of his talking to the horse. He says, Ya Faras Sayyidi, Ya Jawad Sayyidi, O horse of my master. Wallahi, I know what my master is up to. I know he wants to go and join Aba Abdullah. And so if he does not show up, if he does not come, I will ride on your back and I will join Aba Abdullah al Hussein. These are noble examples, brothers and sisters. But on the day of Ashura, there was another noble example. A man, a newlywed, a Christian by the name of Wahab who has just got married. He comes after meeting Aba Abdullah, he decides to abandon his family and fight in his cause. So he goes out, his wife is screaming after him, Habibi, oh my sweetheart, please don't leave me. Don't go. You will be killed. I will be, I will be widowed. Come back. So he's out there not minding what she says, but suddenly he overheard her calling, Qatil tu duna tayyibin ya Habibi. Go fight to protect the life of these good people. My sweetheart, I want you to go get killed. He runs back to her. He says, what happened to you? You were just telling me not to go. And now you're saying I should go fight. She said, La talumni, do not blame me for the call and the cry of Hussein has broken my back. He said, what did you hear him say? She said, I heard him say, Allah Akbar, O companions, O Habib, O Muslim Ibn Awsaj, where were you when Aba Abdullah was left all alone? He came out and he he called you one by one in your names. He said, Ya Habib, Ya Muslim. He called them by name. He then said, Mali unadi fala tujibun. Why do I call on to you and you do not respond? Imagine, Aba Abdullah is so desperate. He is so destitute. He is calling his companions to come back. But then he says, I can see your mutilated body on the ground. Your Imam is calling you, but you do not respond. One hadith says that the bodies of the companions began to shake as though they could hear their Imam calling them. Hamebare safar bastan doraftan. They all packed up and left, and left Aba Abdullah on his own. Hamebare safar bastan doraftan. Hamed Astaz Hussain Shustan Duraftan Ya Allah Allahumma inna nas'aluka wa nad'uk Bismika al-Azim al-A'zam al-A'az al-Ajal al-Akram Ya Allah 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 يا الله يا أرحم الراحمين عجل لوليك الفرج والعافية والنصر يا الله Oh Allah make us among his companions and among his supporters and among those who are martyred under his banner and under his standard يا الله Let's all pay our salutations and our respects to Aba Abdullah al Hussein for Futrus the angel has vowed, according to our hadith, he is the messenger of those who give their salams to Aba Abdullah. He said to the Imam, because you were the reason God forgave me, because 
it was because of your crib that the Almighty Allah forgave my sin. I vow that forever and until the day of judgment, if anyone says their salam upon you, I will, I will be the one bringing the salam to you and then sending back your response, insha'Allah. As-salamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah. وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليكم مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر العهد مني لزيارتكم as loud as you can السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات نهدي ثواب مجلسنا هذا وثواب سورة المباركة الفاتحة مع الصلوات آه.